A false god, a man burned at the stake for reading the Bible, and more horror stories involving Christianity that the church does not want you to know. Don't let your local church know you've watched this video. The False God Baphomet Out of all the false gods to have been created in the history of Christianity, Baphomet is without a doubt the most reviled by the church. Now that's not a word I use sparingly. Baphomet appears as a hermaphrodite human, meaning it has male and female body parts. It also has the head of a goat and is typically depicted sitting cross-legged. The symbol on Baphomet's torso is of two intertwined snakes, the serpents tangled around a sword. On its forehead is a pentagram. Have you ever looked hard enough at Baphomet to see all these individual traits? Have you ever wondered what they all mean? I'm going to fill you in on the disturbing details of Baphomet that the church would rather nobody knew about. The first thing I want to tell you about is the pentagram. It is synonymous with Satanists and with their poster child, Baphomet. But did you know the pentagram isn't as evil as Christians say it is? The earliest pentagrams have been found not in the lairs of Satan worshippers, but on shards of Sumerian pottery from 5,500 years ago. The pentagram that Christians are so afraid of was used as the symbol of the Sumerian gods Ishtar and Marduk. On the other side of the globe in China, the Liangzhu culture used pentagram symbols 5,000 years ago. Even the Greeks used it. Depictions of pentagrams have been found on vases from the 7th century BC in ancient Greece. It was seen as a symbol of well-being, good deeds, and charity. It had nothing to do with evil whatsoever. This is not even the craziest part. By 300 BC, the pentagram had become the symbol of Jerusalem. After Jesus' death and resurrection, newly converted Christians stole the pentagram from the Jewish people and used it to symbolize the five wounds of Christ. One of King Arthur's best knights, Sir Gawain, famously had a pentagram decorating his shield. It was only during Renaissance occultism that the pentagram started to become evil. Then, in the early 20th century, English maniac Aleister Crowley founded the bizarre religion of Thelema. He stole the pentagram and transformed it into a symbol of evil. Baphomet himself has his origins going back to the 12th century. Modern scholars think the name Baphomet is a distortion of the name Muhammad. When Crusader knights heard Turkish soldiers shouting Muhammad, they heard something closer to Baphomet. The knights of the church didn't know much about Islam. They only knew that they were fighting godless heretics and that they were shouting the name of some evil entity. That's where the name came from, but not the notorious goat-headed evildoer most of us are familiar with today. A French occultist named Eliphar Levy created the modern Baphomet in 1861. He isn't nearly as old as people think. He also isn't connected to the devil, even though he does look unmistakably devilish. Are the pyramids in the Bible? How shocked would you be if I said the Egyptians copied the Tower of Babel when they built their first pyramids? And what if I said the Israelites were enslaved and forced to build their pyramids? I hope not too shocked, because I am telling you that right now. Biblical scholars believe the first settlers in Egypt migrated to the land of the Nile from Mesopotamia. These settlers had seen the Tower of Babel fall. They were inspired by its grandeur when they built the earliest pyramids at Saqqara. It's a wild theory that I dare you to disprove. Biblical researchers can't prove it either, but there are some clues that they've picked out from the Bible that support their case. For example, the Bible says that the people of Egypt migrated from the area of Shinar, located near the Euphrates River. Shinar was the place where humanity tried to build the Tower of Babel. For those who don't know how that story ended, here's a brief recap. According to the book of Genesis, when the flood was over, God told humanity to get busy procreating. The exact words used were, increase in number and fill the earth. I think we all pick up what God was putting down. Humanity chose to do the opposite. Genesis says humanity tried to build a tower so tall that they could reach the heavens in defiance of God. Furious, God shattered the tower and scattered the languages of humanity so that people could no longer communicate with one another. Everyone used to speak the same language, but if the Bible is to be believed, God was responsible for creating all the different languages that are spoken today. That's what humanity got for trying to reach the stars. What I find fascinating is that the Tower of Babel may have been a real structure. It could have been a ziggurat, a tiered pyramid made from baked bricks and black pitch. 
When people migrated from China to Egypt, they copied the ziggurats they'd seen in their homeland and started building pyramids. They started with small muddy structures called mastabas, beneath which they buried their rulers. As time passed, the pyramids got bigger and blockier. Then, according to Exodus, the Israelites moved in. This was between 1660 and 1445 BC. As the Israelites gained power and influence, the pharaohs became afraid of them. The Egyptian kings enslaved the Israelites and forced them to build things. The Bible doesn't explicitly say pyramids, but it does give hints. For example, Exodus chapter 5 verse 7 says that the Pharaoh told the taskmasters that you shall no longer give the people straw to make brick as before. He was talking about how the Israelite slaves were forced to make mud bricks. Jewish historian Flavius Josephus wrote that the Egyptian taskmasters forced the Jews to build pyramids using those very bricks. And now for number 7, but first it's shout out time. I wanted to give a big thank you to Blue Wolf Blade and Recon Paul for supporting this channel. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already for more videos like these. The St. Bryce's Day Massacre Some saints are so obscure nobody can even remember why they became saints in the first place. Like St. Bryce, a cleric from the lands of Gaul who became something of a celebrity in Anglo-Saxon England. Trust me, you're going to want to hear this. Bryce was the Bishop of Tours, although his behavior was so poor that he was driven out of his diocese with extreme prejudice. Bryce went on to reform, changing his sinful ways. By the time of his death in 444 AD, he was accepted once more as a holy man. That's pretty much everything that's known about St. Bryce. He was bad, then he was good. Today, people mostly remember his name because of the massacre that occurred on his festival day in 1002 AD. It was brutal. I hope you like Anglo-Saxon and Viking history because this story is filled with it. I'll start with Ethelred the Unready, made King of England at the age of 12 in 978. Ethelred's rule was blighted by frequent Viking attacks. This was peak Viking era with the Norsemen reaching English shores wave after wave to pillage and loot. England was weak. The Vikings had already settled Normandy and had a base of operations on the Isle of Wight. In 994, Olaf Tryggvason and Svein Forkbeard attacked London. They left without much success, but mostly because King Ethelred paid them to go away. Unlike the brave kings who had come before him, Ethelred didn't lead his troops into battle. He paid men to do it for him. His reign was the beginning of a thousand years of kings and queens who more often than not hid behind their armies. On the feast day of St. Bryce, the year 1002, Ethelred gave the order to slaughter all Danish men who were among the English race. He was sick of the Vikings, but this didn't just affect Vikings, it affected the locals too. The Danish people had settled in England more than a century earlier. They were already deeply ingrained in local society. When the king ordered all Danish people killed, he was condemning second and third generation Danes who considered themselves local. What followed was a disaster. Nobody knows precisely how many were killed, but it was a lot. The worst recorded incident was in Oxford. Danish families who were under threat broke into St. Frideswide's church where they cried sanctuary. The locals who considered themselves good, generous Christians burned the church down with the Danes still inside of it. There's an ugly piece of church history. In 1004, two years later, King Ethelred recalled his order for the extermination of all Danes in England. It was too little too late. One of the people killed at the church had been Svein Forkbeard's sister. The Vikings intensified their assaults after that. When King Ethelred died in 1016, almost all of England ended up being ruled by Svein Forkbeard's son, Canute. There's one other massacre that I should mention, just so you have a little more context on why the Anglo-Saxons despised the Danes so much. I hope you're not sick of the bloodshed yet. There was a monastery at Iona that was considered one of the most important religious centers on the British Isles in the Middle Ages. It was founded on a small island off western Scotland in 563. It was from Iona that Christianity spread through the Picts and into the realm of the Anglo-Saxons. When the Vikings arrived in the 8th century, Iona was ripe for the picking. The Vikings attacked the monastery in 795, 802, 806, and 807. After the fourth time, the monks had enough. Fool me once, shame on you. Burn down my monastery four times, I'm not building it again. The monks abandoned the site and moved to Ireland. In the 10th century, the monks went back. 
Then on Christmas Eve of 986, the Danes plundered Iona again. They killed the abbot and 15 men at the church. Brutal attacks like this were what inspired the massacre of 1002 in Oxford. The crazy cult of propaganda due. Secret societies absolutely exist. Shadow governments and states within states are real things. It's just that you don't hear about them until long after they've disappeared. In 1877, Propaganda Due was established in Italy as a Masonic Lodge, authorized by the Grand Orient of Italy. While initially a recognized part of Italian Freemasonry, P2's influence wouldn't last. I can't tell you the absolute secrets of Freemasonry, because they remain secret to this day. What I can say is that Propaganda Due rapidly became one of the most important Masonic lodges in the country. It was frequented by politicians, government officials, and members of the nobility. It was a real secret society, one that the fascists were not interested in supporting when they came into power in 1922. With the rise of the National Fascist Party, the Italian version of the Nazis, Benito Mussolini banned all Masonic lodges and secret societies. From 1922 onward, Propaganda Due remained shrouded in secrecy. Throughout the Cold War, the Lodge became a hotbed of anti-communist free thinkers. Nobody really knew what they were up to until authorities began investigating Michela Sindona. I hope you're on the edge of your seat because this is where the story starts getting really insane. Michela was known as the Shark, one of the top bankers for two of the most powerful organizations in Italy. One of those organizations was the Sicilian Mafia, the other was the Vatican. Michela was also a member of Propaganda Due. Investigators only came to this realization when they started investigating the collapse of Michela's bank and his connection to the mob. In 1981, investigators discovered a list of alleged members of the secret society. The names included military officers, the heads of the Italian Secret Service, and the future Italian Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi. At the time, Berlusconi wasn't even involved in politics. Oh, and let's not forget Victor Emmanuel, the son of the last Italian king. The Italian prime minister in 81 was Arnardo Forlani. He appointed a special team to do some inquiries about propaganda due. But it turned out his closest officials were members. By the end of 1981, Forlani resigned because of the scandal, and the Italian government fell into pieces. What I've just described to you is an actual shadow government in Italy that had members in all the highest places of society. Propaganda Due was allegedly involved in the Bologna Massacre of 1980, which killed 85 people. They were also allegedly involved in the collapse of Banco Ambrosiano, aka the Vatican Bank. Oh yeah, you knew this was going to come back to the Vatican. The secret society was deeply entrenched in church business. They were supposedly behind the 1982 assassination, uh, sorry, suspicious death of Vatican Bank President Roberto Calvi in London. So where are the members of the secret society now? Propaganda Due was officially dissolved in 1982. Not much has been heard about it since. Is it still active? How many of these shadow governments are currently in operation? The first Christians in Antioch. Christianity was born in Antioch. Christ may have died in Jerusalem, but it was in Antioch that the term Christian first appeared. It was a term to describe a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, the ancient city of Antioch has revealed the oldest church in the world. Archaeologists excavated what they think was the original Christian house of worship. Inside the ruins, they found buried chambers where offering jars had been smashed. The discovery shows how closely entwined early Christianity was with paganism. Antioch is an ancient city in Turkey's Hatay province. It was founded near the year 300 BC by none other than Seleucus. He was one of the top generals of Alexander the Great, who inherited a fragment of Alexander's broken empire after his death. From the foundations of Antioch, Seleucus formed the Seleucid Empire. Antioch city grew and prospered, especially under Roman control. It became wildly wealthy and politically influential. During recent excavations in the ruined part of the city, researchers found the world's first cathedral. It appears to have expanded from a dark cave around the year 38. Researchers found floor mosaics, faded frescoes near an altar, and other pieces of artwork from the 4th century AD. 
What started as a remote cavern where Christians met to secretly pray expanded into a massive holy site. Researchers think it may have been Peter himself who established the cave as a church. As in, the Peter, the very first pope. Peter had been a disciple of Christ. After Jesus' death, he went on to lead the first Christian community in Antioch. Rumor has it that Peter's earliest sermons were held in a cave. There are also rumors that St. Luke the Evangelist held his earliest sermons in a cave. Could this be that very cave? It's definitely a possibility. Archaeologists unearthed rooms that had been filled with offering vessels. Smashed pieces litter the floor left behind by pilgrims who brought offerings to Christ. What kind of offerings were in these smashed jugs? This may surprise you, but it was most likely water, maybe even the original holy water. When the very first church was built inside a stinking cave, certain bodies of water were considered sacred. For example, the Jordan River. Some water was thought of as having healing powers. This ancient cave church was built next to a waterway, likely a spring. The early Christian community would have held baptisms in the clean water of the spring. The water didn't stay clean forever, though. By the 4th century, clean water was becoming an issue in the Roman Empire. Springs and rivers that had been clean before were suddenly polluted by human waste. Priests couldn't keep doing baptisms in springs where the water was so heavily polluted. People began bringing their own water, which priests claimed to cleanse of evil spirits. In reality, they were just trying to not baptize people in contaminated water. The origin of holy water is, in all likelihood, priests trying to magically filter bacteria out of polluted water. This is the head of St. John the Baptist. You can see the severed head of John the Baptist for yourself right now. All you need to do is get on a plane and head on over to San Silvestro in Capite, a church in the city of Rome. They have the alleged head of John inside a glass box, resting on some red felt. But wait a second. You can also see the severed head of John the Baptist at a church in France and at a museum in Germany. Wait a second. You can see it at a mosque in Syria as well. Which head is the real thing? What did John the Baptist do anyway that made him so famous? According to Christian lore, John was the guy who baptized Jesus, hence the Baptist part of his name. John also preached about the final judgment that would be passed down by God. He wanted people to repent and be prepared for the end of days. A lesser known fact is that John was a Jewish prophet. Scholars sometimes refer to him as the precursor to Jesus. He was the Jesus before Jesus. Tradition tells us that John was executed for his preaching at the desert fortress of Machiris in Israel. There was recently a video giving more details on Machiris on the channel, so be sure to check it out. To make a long story short, John was beheaded by King Herod Antipas, who was bullied into it by his wife Herodias, who really didn't like John or his preaching. Herodias feared that if John was buried with his body and his head together, he might come back to life as a zombie. So they were kept separate. John's disciples supposedly brought his body to the village of Sebastia. His head went in a different direction. Some believe Herodias had John's head buried underneath the fortress of Machiris. Others claim it was hidden inside Herod's palace in Jerusalem. And by the way, the reason Herod and Herodias had such similar names is that they were related. Herodias had been married to Herod's brother first, also named Herod. I'm sure dinner parties were a little awkward. Regardless of where the head was originally placed, legend has it the head was discovered during the Crusades and brought to Europe. There it ended up in Rome, where it remains at San Silvestro in Capite. It's not the full skull though, only a fragment of the top part. Another piece is said to be at the Cathedral of Amiens in northern France. Then there's the Umayyad Mosque in Damascus, where Islamic tradition says John's head was taken. The Forbidden Gospel of Judas Revealed Judas is reviled across the world for being the betrayer of Jesus Christ. But after 1700 years as a villain, Judas has been revealed in a new, shocking light. Manuscripts have been unveiled that show Judas wasn't a Judas after all. He may have been a hero. It's called the Gospel of Judas, a new spin on an old story, only it's not exactly new. It was written by an ancient Egyptian Christian about a century after the death of Christ. Biblical scholars are calling it the most significant discovery in 60 years. There is only one known surviving copy, 
and it itself is a copy. It might just be the most dangerous ancient book around. There are a lot of Gospels outside the New Testament that were never included in the Bible, so many that I can't even list them all or your brain would explode. The Gospel of Mary, Philip, Sophia, Lentulus, Bartholomew, Nicodemus, Thomas, Apelles, Manny… the list goes on and on and on. Only four Gospels made it into the official Bible, those of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those four guys depicted Judas Iscariot as a traitor in their Gospels. In their accounts of what happened at the end of Jesus' ministry, Judas gave Jesus up to the Romans. Judas sold Jesus for some silver, and the Messiah was crucified. But that's not what it says in the Gospel of Judas. The story in this ancient text is much different. Randolph Kasser is a clergyman and former professor at the University of Geneva in Switzerland. He's also one of the top Coptic scholars in the world. It was thanks to his efforts and his team that the newly found gospel was pieced together and translated. Without dragging this on, here's what the book says. It begins with a very simple announcement. This is the secret account of the revelation that Jesus spoke in conversation with Judas Iscariot. The revelation was spoken three days before Passover. The book immediately jumps into describing Judas as Jesus Christ's closest friend. Of his twelve disciples, Judas was the only one Jesus felt would understand his true message. Jesus knew that it was time for him to shed his mortal coil, but he needed one of his disciples to betray him. Jesus preferred that his best friend be the one to sell him out to the Romans. Jesus said it was better to end at the hands of a friend than at the hands of an enemy. Ain't that the truth? The Gospel of Judas changes everything the church has been telling humanity for the last 2,000 years. Judas was a friend to Jesus, not a traitorous fiend who coveted silver. Even if that's true, good luck convincing every church in the world to change what they've been preaching. The horrifying martyrdom of Perpetua and Felicity. Christian myth is filled with martyrs. Jesus was technically the first martyr, but his death wasn't even the worst. Sure, being crucified would have been horrible, but check out what happened to Perpetua and Felicity. Vibia Perpetua had recently been married. She was well-educated, of noble blood, and was just 22 years old when disaster struck. Perpetua and Felicity, a slave woman, were brutally martyred in Carthage under the orders of Emperor Septimius Severus. What happened to these two women can be found in the Passion of Saints Perpetua and Felicity, the narration of their deaths. The ancient text begins with Perpetua arguing with her father. She had recently become a Christian, but her father wanted her to renounce her beliefs. Perpetua refused and was baptized. Then she was imprisoned in Carthage because Christianity was not allowed. Perpetua was tortured physically and emotionally. The prison guards were rough and left her to roast in the ungodly heat. A lot of the text is details of physical torment that I'm definitely not getting into here. The day before her death, Perpetua received a vision. In her vision, she climbed a ladder and at the foot of the ladder found a serpent. She was able to move beyond the serpent and climb up to a beautiful garden. She knew then what was to come would be suffering. She would die, but only after facing the serpent, aka the devil. Perpetua was not the only one imprisoned in Carthage. She was also there with Felicity, of course, who happened to be pregnant. There were three other men, too, and on the final day they were joined by another man who had gone to the emperor and revealed himself as a Christian. On the day of the emperor's birthday, a great celebration was being held in Carthage. The prisoners were taken from their dungeon cell and brought into an arena. What happened next was a bloodbath. The Christians faced off against a bear, a leopard, a wild boar, and an angry bull. You could probably guess who won. The animals claimed a resounding victory, and Perpetua went down in history as one of the earliest saints, along with Felicity. What do you think would be worse, being eaten by a leopard or crucified? You were never supposed to read the Bible. The church never wanted you to read the Bible. I told some weird stories today, but this is one thing the church truly does not want people knowing. You were never supposed to be able to read the holy book. The Bible has been banned and censored ever since it was written in one fashion or another. For example, in the early 4th century of the Roman Empire, authorities burned Christian scriptures wherever they could find them. There were actual book burnings in the Roman Empire, but the books that were being burned were Christian. 
The empire encouraged their citizens to make sacrifices to pagan gods. The Bible denounced such gods, so the Romans burned the book. Things would change very quickly. By the Middle Ages, the Bible was everywhere, but only in certain languages, which prevented most people from reading it. Pope John X tried to ban the old church Slavonic translation of the Bible in 920. Around 1229, the Roman Catholic Church tried to ban anyone owning a Bible in any Romance language. You might think a Romance language is some weird, freely way of speaking in the Middle Ages, but that's not the case. Spanish, French, Italian, Portuguese, and Romanian are all considered Romance languages. By banning any ownership of a Bible in these languages, the Church prevented millions of people from being able to read the Word of God. In 1409, Archbishop Richard Arundel prohibited the Bible from being translated into English. The Church did everything within their power to prevent the masses from being able to read the Bible. Their official reasoning was that, according to Church leaders, people couldn't handle the Bible. The top guys at the Vatican feared that if ordinary people, aka the peasants, could read the Bible, they would wrongly interpret scriptures. The Church wanted everyone to learn about the Bible only through the words of their own priests. These restrictions couldn't last forever. By the 16th century, people were pretty upset about the strict rules around reading an English Bible. In England, it was one of the sparks that ignited the Protestant Reformation. Which brings us to William Tyndale. William, a genius linguist born in 1494, was the first man to translate the Hebrew Bible into the English Bible. Thanks to the recent invention of the printing press, William was able to mass-produce and distribute English Bibles, all against the will of the Church. The Church authorities opposed his translations, fearing misinterpretations and challenges to their authority. Tyndale faced persecution for his work, living in exile and facing threats. He was eventually arrested and strangled, then his body burned at the stake in 1536. Here's a little tidbit of information for you. William was the first guy to use Jehovah as the name of God, which is still the preferred name of God by Protestants today. The church was not happy about what William was doing. Like an escaped hound, William was forced to flee England while agents of King Henry VIII hunted him. He sought refuge in the territory of Charles V, Holy Roman Emperor. It didn't really work out. He was arrested, put in jail for a year, and in 1536 convicted of heresy. By bringing the Bible, which the church never wanted people to read, to the people, William was condemned to death by strangulation. After he was strangled, he was burned at the stake. What's the craziest story you've ever heard about the church burning someone at the stake? Let me know in the comments, and thanks so much for watching! Remember to come back soon for more unbelievable videos from the channel.